So uh, first thing I should say is thank you everyone for coming. Uh, there, there are a couple of people in the room who I haven't seen for 20 years. So uh, it's amazing when things go up on, uh, on uh, uh, Twitter and things like that, how many people say, oh, that looks interesting, and I know that person. So uh, I appreciate you being here. The other people uh, uh, with whom a lot of this book uh, uh, was co-created over years, even though they, they didn't know it. Andrew Bird is sitting there, and people who I sat in the trenches with in various countries and, and, and shook my head and said, is this really happening? Um, <laughs> he's, he's laughing. Um, so the book is called The Limits of Institutional Reform in Development, and very simply, institutions are the rules of the game. Institutional reform is the effort to change the rules of the game, hopefully to make the world better. Uh, there is a lot of this in the world, and the book essentially tries to make the argument that we haven't been that very successful at this. Not that we've completely failed, but that we've succeeded in some things, but not necessarily in others. So what I wanted to share with today is a little bit of the argument in the book. Um, that also tries to kind of come out and say, how could we do things better in the future? And a lot of people say, could you give me an example of how to do things better in the future? And I thought that what I would do, because we have uh, Per Mullander here, is try to kind of give my take on how I think things happened in Sweden uh, and, and how I think it might uh, reflect on things in the book. Now, that's a very risky undertaking because I've never been to Sweden uh, <laughs> and, and, and that he was actually involved in the reform. So uh, I'm open to the chance that he says it's a really interesting story, but not quite true. Um, anyway, uh, here's where I started with the book, is, is what I would say is kind of startling evidence. And the evidence is that I institutional reform is everywhere now in development. And it only really came about in the early 1980s when Douglas North started speaking about institutions and showing a link between institutions, again, rules of the game and growth, and saying countries that have good rules of the game grow better than others and are wealthier. And so the international development community said, well, we're all about wealth and we're all about growth and we're all about this kind of stuff, so we kind of need to stop just focusing on building roads and maybe think about you know, governing institutions as well. In that period of time, uh, institutional reform has grown from being about 1% of the World Bank's uh, lending agenda to being somewhere between 50 and 65%. Uh, it's a very, very significant area of business now. Uh, whether you're doing an agricultural reform, a roads reform, or our bread and butter governance reforms, pretty much there are changes in laws, there are changes in government structures, and there are efforts to change the rules of the game. It's everywhere. The second thing that's interesting in the evidence is that reforms look really common across different countries. So whether you're talking about uh, Uganda from the 1980s or whether you're talking about Georgia from the mid-90s or whether you're talking about, uh, about Afghanistan starting in 2003, 2004, generally countries uh, are supported by the international community to do similar things at similar times. Uh, in my research, I basically show that there's kind of like a 75% overlap of the reform story in any given country. Not that everything is the same, but there's an incredible amount that's the same. So you'd think, well, this suggests that we really know what we're doing. You know, we have a right model and, uh, you know, we, we, we do it everywhere, so gee, we must be good at this. Not quite. The donors themselves who actually do this reform, essentially, when they evaluate how well this works, the, the success rate is somewhere between 30 and 60 percent, depending on what you're looking at. Now, it's not very good to me. Uh, you know, and, and uh, in, 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 in all of the evaluations, there are ways in which the donors speak about this and blah, blah, blah. But essentially, 30 to 60 percent of the projects don't deliver what they intended to do. Even when they do deliver what the project intends to do, you have to understand that they're saying, well, they managed to pass a law. Not necessarily that there's any execution of the law, okay? And not necessarily that actually people live by the law and that it's changed the way that people behave. Um, so essentially, to me, this is a story about a reform agenda that's new, very big, takes up a lot of money, seems to suggest that we know the answer, um, but is not working well. The excuses that people had when I started coming up with these observations were things like, well, the government's just, you know, they weren't sincere when they did the reforms, or the reforms are new and they're going to pay off in 20 years' time, or, you know, all of these kinds of things that uh, uh, maybe we just didn't do enough and we need to do more. 
And in the book, and I'm not going to go into it now, I basically look at all of these things and say those don't really carry that much water. We, we, those excuses don't work to explain very much of what's going on. And a new explain, uh, explanation is more looking at the evidence to say um, it's not that reforms are either countries are going down or going up, it's that they, they seem to be going like this. So they'll go up for a period of time and everyone says, gee, they're doing really well, and then they'll kind of hit the skids and go down. And then they'll go up again and people will say, well, they're doing really well. The poster child for this is Argentina. Is there anyone here from Argentina? Good, I can, oh uh, yes, okay. <laughs> but uh, essentially, you know, Argentina in the 1990s starts off uh, from a very bad place and says we're going to do all of these fiscal reforms and we're going to change the rules of the game and our politicians are going to behave themselves, etc. And, and the, the IMF come out and make statements like, you know, these guys are serious reformers and they show the world how to do it. Then in 96 we find out that none of it was real uh, and the country goes back into a slide for a number of years and the IMF start to say they didn't do anything. And then in 2002, the government responds by introducing exactly the same reforms that they did in the 1990s and saying, no, this time we're going to do it better. And, by, and, and the IMF literally comes and says, well, you know, we've got a new administration, they mean it. And then in 2006, we back again saying they're really terrible. So the idea is there's a signal, but then there's a failure to act on the signal. Uh, and the signals are often kind of, we're going to do the best practices. They're really difficult to do and then we can't implement them, we fail, and then we signal again. I have many, many examples. Uh, and, I you know, the problem with reforms as signals is that they are adopted with very little reflection on context. So, you know, you kind of say, well, what is it that you want us to tell you that we're doing? We'll tell you that we're doing that thing. Uh, we're not going to spend enough time to see if it actually makes any sense given who we are. So, you know, in Argentina they committed to doing fiscal reforms, but any, any student of the, Argent of the Argentine political system would have said these things are not going to work because of the informality in the system. It's not possible. Um, and and, and even, you know, even at the time there were people saying this isn't going to work, but no one really paid attention. The second thing is they promise complex best practices that take an incredible amount to make work, um, but then they don't actually provide the things that are required. Uh, I use the example of accounting reforms in Africa in the private sector, where I I I if, if, if you want an accounting reform to work, you have to have norms of disclosure where people, businesses actually agree that it's a good thing to share your information with some accountants or auditors and for those people to determine uh, if, if, if you are, uh, if, if you are uh, doing things properly or not. Now, if you don't have those norms of disclosure, you can have accounting firms and accounting laws and accounting systems, but it's not going to work, and that's kind of where we are. So to pull it off, you need a lot, and the reforms don't always provide that. The third thing is that they involve champions, but not the people who actually have to do the work. So when I was working in the World Bank, you could put a project through as long as you had the Minister of Finance's signature. Okay, but often most of the reforms I was dealing with didn't really involve the Minister of Finance after five days. After five days, they involved the budget director in the Ministry of Health or the district budget head. And no one ever asked those people what they thought. And so, you know, essentially these guys, when they get the reform and they're told to do it, they just don't because they either can't or they haven't bought into it and they don't think it matters. So because you put these things together and they deliver, you know, some results, a new law, a new unit or whatever, but, you know, I say you get the what you see is not what you get problem in development. And my, my best example of this at the moment, I'm doing some work in Uganda. Uganda on record has the best anti-corruption laws in the world. Global integrity scores them 100 out of 100. Italy is 81. Uh, and I'm going to talk about Italy later so you'll understand why I mention them. The problem in Uganda is that global integrity also measures the implementation of the law and it scores 48. So the gap is 52. What you see is not what you get. Italy scores 76. The gap is 5. So, you know, I say in Italy, it doesn't look that good, but it is what it is. Uganda, it's a different problem. So, you know, I say the context problem in a picture. Uh, uh, oftentimes, you look in a developing country and you say, well, how much reform can we do? Or you don't ask that question and you find that the whole is quite small, meaning there isn't really that much capacity and the political will to do things is not that great. If you say, dang it, I'm going to do the reform anyway. And so you end up really kind of with this square peg that you fit into that round hole, and after a while it just doesn't fit.
The content problem in a picture is that often institutions are like icebergs. Essentially, they have a part that we can see, which is kind of the law or the regulation or the agency, but there's a hell of a lot that is kind of below the surface and we don't know. Like I say, norms, cognitive beliefs, understandings of what the world really looks like. And these are often the things that give life to laws and things like this. And if they're not there, you're not going to get those things having any traction in your society. The problem is that we build a lot of the regulative mechanisms at the top because that's what we can see, but we don't necessarily pay attention to the things at the bottom. My colleague Ricardo Hausman, Hausman calls this iceberg tips. They're the, kind that, they're the kind that sink. Using a diagram also to show the agency problem. There's a circle there and it's got a lot of letters in the circle. And then there's another circle that's open. The, the one that is, uh, is colored in is meant to kind of represent the domestic environment in which reform happens. And the other one is kind of the, the world of the World Bank or the world of DFID outside of the country. And oftentimes what you do is you make sure that you have a Minister of Finance telling you, you know, we're going to sign off on the loan and it's, and, and it's going to work. But what the diagram is meant to show is in the context where you're doing the reform, the Minister of Finance is only one player and you need multiple players. And those multiple players are in different part of the network, meaning that they are not all influenced by the same norms or the same authority structures or even the same basic ideas. And if you don't reach those people or if you don't have a way of reaching them, which the World Bank doesn't and if it doesn't, you, you, you just lose a part of the picture. And so you lose reach and you lose any capacity for diffusion or for scaling up or even for making the thing really work. Now we propose at, at Harvard and in the book, we say half of the chapters are kind of this negative picture. And, and, and yesterday my former advisor wrote a review of this and he said, by the time you get to chapter six, you're going to be really depressed. Uh, but carry on and read chapter seven, eight and nine. Because in seven, eight and nine, I basically say this isn't the story of the whole world. Remember I said to you that even the donors find there are some successes with what they're doing. And when I look at some of the success stories involving donors and involving developing countries in doing this really tough thing of, of changing the rules of the game, the first thing is that there are some. There are some countries that are doing this. But it doesn't work in this way where you get a solution from the outside and you force it in and you don't pay attention to the context and you just get one signature. What I see is a very, very different thing happening. And we call it PDIA, and other reviewers have said, someone said, professors have to have these things with acronyms. Um, and uh, Alan Hudson from One, who I guess his, his, his life is about, uh, is about messaging, he, he basically said to me, um, I can see you don't know anything about marketing. Uh, be that as it may, uh, the alternative is called problem-driven iterative adaptation. And the idea is, what we see is that successes, first and foremost, don't start with a set of solutions where you look at best practice countries and you say, that's what works there, we're going to do it here. It starts with problems. It starts with saying we actually have a hole in the shoe and we need to fix it and enough of us agree where it is, what it looks like and that it needs to be fixed. The, the problem becomes really important because that's where you get the, 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 that's where you get the um, acceptance that people need to look at the institutions that exist and maybe move away from them. That's also the thing that guides the search for solutions that fit into your context. And it's also the thing that builds the energy of diverse groups to work together to actually implement the change. The second thing is that they emerge iteratively. They seldom emerge in one, in, in, in one big piece, in one big project, which we would do in, you know, in the World Bank, you kind of get one bite at the, at, at, at the cherry. You have a four-year project, and that four-year project, you have to completely transform the way the government works. So everything comes in in that one thing. And what we're seeing is actually that's not how it works. They start with a problem, they push into the problem and start to solve that, and they find some things through maybe experimenting, trying things out, and after a few years, they, 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 they find that that leads to the next step and the next step and the next step, and it emerges in a much more um, endogenous process. The third thing is it involves multiple agents. And it involves multiple agents, not just when you get to implementation, but from the beginning. And this is where the idea of distributed leadership comes from, is it doesn't only involve multiple agents just as people who are involved. It involves multiple agents providing leadership roles. And in the book, I speak about a, um, a project that I was involved in that, that really stumped me for a number of years. 
uh, as a kind of a failed economist and someone who now just is interested in people, uh, I started thinking about leadership, something that I always thought was way beneath me because you can't measure it and it looks very iffy. And I started going to projects that looked successful around the world and asking people, I who led this? And you know, that's my approach to doing research on leadership. Who was the leader and what did they do? And everyone beforehand said, you know, what you're going to find in Afghanistan is they're going to tell you it was, uh, it was President Karzai. And when you go to Rwanda, everyone's going to tell you that it was President Kagame. And these are hierarchical places and it's civil service and people always are going to tell you the person at the top. So we interviewed 140 odd people in 12 different places and we got 144 names. I didn't know what to do with that. It was very strange. When we started analyzing what they said when we asked them why did you identify them, we found that there were common patterns of different roles that were played by people that were called leaders. And sometimes the role was that person gave us the authority to act. Sometimes it w that was the person who, who, who identified the problem. Sometimes it was that was the person who had the idea. And we found that very seldom was, were all of those different functions that you need to make change happen in one person. There's no super muscular agent out there. There are groups of agents who do important things at important times and together those things facilitate change. And it's when you get the mobilizers who bring them together that you actually make the magic happen. Now, think of what I was saying before is the problem. The problem is that you have a solution-driven approach with best practices that don't pay any attention to context that come through narrow champions. This is exactly the opposite approach. It's a very different approach, but it's a very possible approach that we see happening on the margins of development. And really, you see a lot of kind of almost heroes of development, people at the front line who are working outside of the normal processes of the World Bank or DFID or whoever, and who are trying to make this thing happen. Um, but you just don't see enough of it. Now, the argument I'm going to try and make now, and this is the, 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 the way I'm becoming vulnerable, is to say I think this is how best practices actually emerged in the developing countries. And the mistake we make is we look at Sweden and we say, look at that best practice, let's replicate that. And we should be asking, how did Sweden do it and can we replicate the process by which they came up with such an effective thing? So here's Sweden's story in, in short is that the country came back from a major financial crisis in the early 1990s. What the graph shows you is, is a period in which uh, the country was in significant deficit. I think it got to about 13% at one time per. Uh, and introduced a bunch of reforms in the mid-1990s that kind of came to a head in 96, 97. Didn't stop there, carried on there. And pretty much up until uh, the current period ha have, have had uh, fair control of their budget system. Uh, where I came up with this gra graph was on a blog of someone working in the US Treasury who put this up there and said, we need to copy Sweden in 2009 uh, because they said, you know, Sweden is, is, has got the results that we want. And it was interesting because the blog then said, the solution is that Sweden has a fiscal council, and I'll get to this in a second, and we need to copy their fiscal council. I'm not going to go into detail of what it is because it kind of doesn't really matter, but I'll tell you why it matters in a second. Now, uh, and let me basically go past this. How I look at the Sweden, Swedish story is, 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 is in a sense I see, I see Sweden look very much like a lot of the developing countries that I worked with in its PFM area in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that's a dangerous thing to say with the Swedes sitting at the table. But essentially you saw a lot of, you know, you saw some, a lot of people aware that there were things going wrong in the public financial management system, that uh, uh, it was in need of reform, and there were many efforts to introduce reforms for a good period of time. Most of these things didn't really work, and most of them were plucked out of other places. We were talking earlier about the program budgeting reforms that were plucked out of the U.S. and put into the Ministry of Defense in the 1960s, and, you know, they, they didn't really work very well. I see some of these things in the 1980s as well. Um, so mostly what you had in, it was kind of lessons of failure from these past reforms, which is kind of what I see when I look at Africa and a lot of other developing countries. And uh, it, in, in, in the early 1990s, it, it is alarming to me at, at how, how many things Sweden didn't have. It didn't have a budget calendar. 
Uh, it didn't really have procedural authority in the Ministry of Finance. It didn't have expenditure controls. Things that when you look at Sweden now, you would imagine must have been there for 100 years because they work so well. You think, well, these things take time to actually take place. Surely they weren't there in 1992. They were there in 92. No, they, they weren't there in 1992. So then they had this gigantic crisis. You had this financial sector meltdown and the country went into deficit. And this is a crucial point in time. But it's not a point in time where they phoned the World Bank or the IMF, as, as did Argentina at the exact moment, and said, what should we do? And the IMF said, you should copy New Zealand and introduce <coughs> these fiscal rules, uh, which is exactly the same time that's what ha what's happened. Essentially, you know, the government initially started with an austerity uh, program and got control over the finances. Um, but apart from that, you had a group of technocrats, and I actually thought that Pierre was in the Ministry of Finance at the moment, but it actually makes my story better. Some technocrats in the ministry and some who were outside of the ministry, which included Pierre. Remember I said groups make a difference, it's not just the minister. Um, who were essentially trying to create the story that we needed reform. And one of the things that they did is they went to another person who was actually in Indiana at the time, Jürgen van Hagen, who was an academic. We do have some importance in the world. And had created an index that showed the quality of budget systems in uh, EU countries. And um, that he, he convinced Jürgen to uh, assess Sweden's system on the basis of this. And they came out, and I don't think that I have the diagram here. I don't have the diagram, and I'm sorry about that, because we were talking about that just now. And Per shows this diagram. You have it. Yeah. That he'll show you just now, that essentially showed that Sweden performed second worst out of all the countries that were assessed. Now, that's interesting, and that's bound to get some attention. But more interesting than, than that, the country that was just in front of it was Greece, and the one that was just below it was Italy. So it allowed for a very interesting narrative that is bound to uh, help you frame a problem, which is we don't want to be like Italy and we don't want to be like Greece because we're Sweden and we always thought we were more like Germany maybe. And, and interestingly enough, that is a narrative that helped to create a problem and create some urgency that made it a focal point uh, that allowed them to really get a lot of energy into the reform. From 92 to 97, there were a lot of ideas put forward, uh, passed through the parliament. There was a process of engaging multiple people, learning from the ideas, um, and, and essentially in 96, 97, introducing, and I'm moving quickly because I'm, I'm taking up time, uh, introducing a new law um, that actually had a lot of buy-in, that, that from the beginning uh, would work because it reflected the Swedish realities. It reflected what people in the parliament and people in the government saw as an appropriate and relevant response to the problem that they were facing. Um, and that then in the years to come led to other reforms. We were discussing earlier how uh, in 2000 there was the introduction of some, some fiscal rule type elements. They didn't come in in 97, they came in afterwards when you, know, you moved from one thing and then you iterated to the next and since that time you've moved to others. Now, do you remember I mentioned the, 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 the commission that this best practice blog said America needs to copy? Uh, that said, this is, this is really the secret to the success. That only came in in 2008. But that is one of the problems of people who look at a system and look at what it looks like now and says, I'm going to judge what made that successful. You often get it wrong. It's the process that led to this that I think made Sweden successful. And if we can replicate that process in developing countries, uh, we'd be much better than trying to replicate what it looks like today. So some lessons. The reforms were, uh, were influenced uh, by context very deeply. That it was people within the context not only saying we have a crisis, but saying how do we use the crisis and how do we construct a narrative that moves people in a way that they actually do reforms that are going to be pretty deep and pretty painful. Um, and that then allow you to go into what I call purpose of muddling, which is I don't really know what the solution is today, but I'm going to take some ideas and I'm going to work with those ideas and move towards solutions and iterative process over a period of time, which is what I think has happened in Sweden. Um, let me move past that and that. 
and say what is the implications I think for institutional reform in development and the, the role of indicators and things like this given that uh, some people in the room might be interested in what's going to happen with uh, development post-2015 and are we going to have a governance indicator where we force every government in the world to behave in the same way. The first thing is I think instead of kind of hawking solutions and becoming salesmen of best practice, which I think development has kind of become in many countries, we need to focus on you know, sparking and supporting local change processes. They're happening all around us. There's so many things going wrong in developing countries that you know, looking for problems is not going to be that hard. The thing is, how do you turn the things that are going wrong into problems that people pay attention to like these guys did in Sweden? Um, the second thing is foster these purpose of muddling processes where you find and fit solutions that actually work in that context. Part of the purpose of muddling processes involves engaging with the people who are going to have to live with the new rules of the game afterwards. Because if they're not ready to live with them and they don't buy into them, and that's just not, not just saying you know, that, that they feel threatened by them, but it's saying that they actually get it and they actually think this is a good thing they're not going to work. You're going to end up with Ugandan anti-corruption laws that look fabulous, but a country that has a major corruption crisis every four years. doesn't work. And the last thing I would say is instead of looking for champions, we need to be building change communities. People like Per in, uh, in, in a, um, uh, a research agency, people in the Ministry of Finance, people potentially in the other ministries around government, and yes, maybe even academics in Harvard or in... Um, in, in elsewhere in the USA. Create communities of people because you don't know where the idea is going to come from. You don't know where maybe the money will come from. And you don't know who's going to provide you authority in that moment where if you don't have the authority to push through, the reform dies. You need to have those groups and you need to build them. And this is something that I think the international community could do. Now in the title I said, what is the role of indicators? And you'll see in the rest of the slide, I have no role of indicators. And one of the reasons why I have no role of indicators is because my critique is of reforms as signals. And I think that global indicators that say what you need to do is X, Y, and Z create, they, they, they perpetuate the best practice idea that we actually know what we're doing and that what you should do is what everybody else should do and that we can actually assess you and that when you perform very well on this, it actually means something. And my sense is that we've been doing that for 15 or 20 years. And what we find is countries, and I'm going to say it again, like Uganda, do very well on the indicators and very, very well, very, very poorly otherwise. They have mastered the form at the expense of the function. And I, I think that we need to be careful with indicators in this area because uh, I, I think that it, it, it fosters the signaling behavior and it doesn't necessarily encourage people to pay serious attention to the context, to look for content that works for them and to build change communities that you can't reflect in an indicator. So thank you very much. <laughs> and please buy the book. <laughs>